generators. They're on. Fire warning. It's check. Communication radios. On. Amos. On. Safety belt shoulder harness. Path on. Task of on. Press NV. Caution and advisory panels. Good check. Interesting. Pins, chunks, and ground wire. Remove. Rotor brake. Rotor brake is off. Fuel control levers. Open. Open. Number two engine. Use all the clear there. Turn it to. Yeah, I feel like I get some kind of stick in here. So, you know, Let me take a look at the pilot's flight controls. The pilot's got the flight controls. Go ahead and climb up a little bit and get some altitude. Yeah, it feels like we may have a sticky pilot valve or something. Save this, save this, save this. I'm having a tough time controlling it. Try your man. I don't think we're going to get it down. Good morning. I'm Senior Master Sergeant Lon. Welcome to Underwater Egress Refresher Training. During the next two to three hours, we intend to reacquaint you with those procedures and techniques which will enhance your chances of surviving an overwater helicopter ditching. In order to do this, we plan on emphasizing the following helicopter airframes, the H-60, the H-53, the H-3, and the UH-1N. The training program will consist of the following areas. During the last two years, over 130 military personnel have been involved in emergency helicopter ditchings. Over a third of those occupants were killed. Of those that survived, nearly 80% had received some type of underwater egress training. Used together to extract you from a sinking helicopter. I'd the like two biggest out. problems associated with underwater escapes are inrushing water when the aircraft starts to sink and disorientation from unusual attitudes. Premature release of a harness or lap belt usually results in confusion and death. Not panic, and they were able then to free themselves from the wreckage, egress from the aircraft, and successfully make their way to the surface. The most important factor common to successful escapes is the confidence that underwater egress training provides. Are there any questions? If not, let's head out to the tank. In the event your helicopter must be ditched, you should follow a basic sequence of events. Check your survival equipment. Make sure you're securely strapped in. Okay, sit down, strap in. Locate Lock some reference secure. points for Check escape. Check your survival gear. Brace for impact. That's your exit. When you hit the water, release it, push it out, hold on to your reference point. Remember that having a reference point before going underwater go. is probably the most important thing you can do. Note any obstructions which might delay your exit. Brace for impact. Hold on to your reference point. After impact, maintain your reference point. If you can reach an escape hatch while remaining strapped in, now's the time to open it. If the aircraft begins to sink, take a last deep breath and wait for violent motion to cease.
Keep your hands off your harness or lap belt. Premature release can kill you. If you have a helicopter emergency egress device, or HEED-2, insert the mouthpiece just after you hit the water. Airflow starts automatically. Breathe normally, always exhaling while ascending. If you're not able to activate the HEED, your first priority should be a normal escape. Release your lap belt or shoulder harness maintaining one hand on your reference point. Pull yourself hand over hand following reference points to the nearest exit. Avoid swimming out and kicking, which may result in injury to others behind you. Place both hands on the frame and pull yourself forcefully out. When clear of the aircraft, but not before, inflate your LPU. Once you reach the surface, clear debris and swim away. The best swimming technique is the breaststroke, followed by the back and side strokes. Use the crawl only to get away from debris or to reach a nearby life raft. Endurance, rather than speed, is the most important in survival swimming. If a life raft is available, gather everyone on board and check for injuries. Most military helicopters share some underwater egress problems. The co-pilot's position, for example, can be obstructed by the collective. The co-pilot must ensure the pitch lever is out of the way should escape be necessary. Your communications cord can hinder your escape once the cabin fills with water. Make sure you disconnect before you begin your egress. Every helicopter has its own characteristics which affect underwater egress. The H-1 has a natural tendency to roll right toward the pilot's side once it hits the water. Consequently, most escapes will be from the left side of the H-1. The H-1 pilot and co-pilot's secondary egress should be through the crew compartment. The backs of the seats make for effective handholds as you work your way through the door frame. From the main H-1 cabin, crewmen and passengers should exit through the door nearest them. The windows may also be removed by pulling on a single handle, creating several alternate escapes. The H-3 poses some distinct underwater egress problems. Although the H-3 has a natural buoyancy, like most helicopters, it's top-heavy. Therefore, it may roll within seconds after impact into the water. External fuel tanks may provide stabilization of the helicopter while in the water. Extending the landing gear will somewhat stabilize the aircraft by lowering the vertical center of gravity. Pilot and co-pilot exit routes are essentially the same in the H-3 as the H-1. However, the flight engineer's seat may create an obstacle for secondary pilot and co-pilot egress if it's in the down position. Conditions permitting, the cargo door assembly should be opened prior to water landing. Otherwise, stress between the cargo door assembly and airframe might cause difficulty in opening, particularly if the helicopter inverts in the water. Other H3 egress points from the crew cabin are two jettisonable windows, one over each sponson. And although the H3 has a ramp, it would not normally be used for egress since it's not quickly released or may be filled with cargo. The H-53 shares some similarities but several differences to the H-3. The H-53 upon landing in water may remain stabilized due to its external fuel tanks and overall better balance than the H-3. 
If the helicopter does not invert, standard egress procedures should be followed. Another H-53 egress point is the hatch located on the left forward side of the cargo compartment. It can be removed from the inside by turning both handles in a clockwise direction. Underwater emergency egress from the H-60 requires some unique precautions. Since secondary egress from the cockpit is very difficult, pilot and co-pilot must ensure they jettison their entire doors prior to ditching. And they must move armor plating out of their escape path. If either H-60 pilot or co-pilot attempts a secondary exit through the main cabin, they will find obstructions in their path. Consequently, their best secondary egress may be the opposite cockpit door. For crew egress, the H-60 has two sliding cabin doors. These doors should be opened prior to contact with the water. H-60 cabin passengers and crew members have shoulder harnesses in addition to lap belts, which connect to a common release mechanism. Everyone on board should be familiar with their release. The H-60's gunner's egress is the window in front of him. He must remember to clear his gun from the window prior to actual ditching. The H-60 crew compartment may have numerous configurations and subsequent obstructions. Medical evacuees may be on board, or a hoist. Everyone should consider these obstructions to their own emergency underwater escape, especially should you have to get out at night. Safe underwater emergency egress depends on proper crew procedures. England approach control, Razor 6-5 with emergency. Razor 65, Eglin approach, go ahead with your emergency. Roger, sir, Razor 65, we're about 40 miles south Herbert this time, uh, experiencing uh, severe vibrations, and we'll be requested direct into Herbie for a full stop. Razor 65, Roger, Herbert is landing runway 36, wind calm, altimeter 299 or 2. Say souls on board, few remaining in minutes, and squawk many on 7700. Yeah, Roger, sir, we have eight souls on board. We got about two and a half hours of fuel remaining. And we're going to squawk 7700 this time. Razor 65, Roger. Radar contact. Stand by ditching checklist, sir. Ditching checklist. Crew passengers alerted. Survival equipment. We have the raft in position on the right side, sir. Roger, copy. Safety belt, shoulder harness. Fasten the lock, pilot. Fasten the lock, copilot. Flight preservers. Okay, I've got mine on. LPU, uh, go. Make sure everybody's aware not to pop until we're out of the aircraft. Roger, sir. Feeling the pedal's pretty hard now. Yeah, I can start to really feel it. It's getting worse. Good y'all kicks. The tail just went. Auto rotation enter immediately. Throttle shut off. Landing gears up. Mayday, mayday, mayday. Landing gears up. We're going in. Raider 6-5 is going in present position. Mayday, mayday. Mayday, mayday, mayday. We just lost Razor 
Mentally review proper procedures every time you board the aircraft for an overwater flight. Establish reference points and know your secondary exits. Remember, you may only have seconds to live. <laughs>